Hello, Hoboken. Actually, it was at a theater performance once where they got the city wrong. It's all a bit embarrassing. So anyway, what I'm going to do today uh, for about 20 minutes is talk about innovation. Uh, my slides are going to get up there in a minute. But when they do, the reason I, I want to talk about innovation is I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about startup innovation versus innovation in large companies. So I'm going to talk about how those things are actually very, very similar. And hopefully you'll get an understanding from that about how we came to sponsor this event. We came here because there's a complete brotherhood between VC-backed innovation and the type of innovation that Bell Labs does. Those of you who have heard of Bell Labs but sort of forgotten about Bell Labs, I'll only do a little bit on that. We invented the transistor, and many of you are tech people, so the transistor is the digital device that essentially is the underpinning of every process of technology because it's a thing that switches on and off electronically rather than the old vacuum tubes. There was an estimate that there are 1 times 10 to the 21 transistors in the world, which is 10 billion Milky Ways, if I'm not mistaken. So if you think of Milky Way as a big thing out there in space, 10 billion of those equals the number of transistors in the world. We also invented the laser, uh, Unix, C, C++, the CCD camera in your phone, many, many other things. So we've won a ton of Nobel Prizes. And people tend to think, well, you, your job is to win Nobel Prizes. But in fact, it's not. It's to innovate the future, like VC-backed companies, like entrepreneurs everywhere. We try and think about what the future is and then innovate it. And the only difference really between us, and I'll show that during my talk, is we take a little more time up front. Because we're backed by a large company, we have the freedom to actually explore a bit more up front before we actually move to commercialization. And the big difference you're gonna see in my talk, I think, with startups is little less exploration up front because that step of commercialization is much harder for a startup. But otherwise, we're part of a continuum together. So hopefully, you'll get to understand that during my talk. I even have, yes, a PowerPoint animation because, of course, in the end, that's all we know how to do. So I want to remind people what the definition of innovation is. This is just from Webster's Dictionary. It's invention and implementation. So invention, that's the original breakthrough idea, the idea that you can change the world and the world needs something. The dreamer, the vision, the initial insight, the initial new formula, new algorithm, new piece of tech. But that doesn't mean anything if you don't then turn it into implementation. It's a little bit like Aaron's thing, idle ideas don't fly. Inventions alone don't fly. They need to be implemented to become an innovation. And of course, you all know that innovation has an element of timing and luck in there. But we're going to ignore that part. We're just going to assume that if we invent the right thing, we Im implement it in the right way, we'll be successful. But that's the defini definition I want you to hold on to because it's really important to understand it's both things. Because between the Bell Labs model and the vc back model, those two things both matter. All that changes is how much time you spend on the invention phase versus how much time you spend on the implementation phase. Thank you. People whooping up implementation. The Bell Labs team are back there, so they should whoop it up a bit more. There we go, they're the ones in blue. That's our new, uh, we, we, become, we were acquired by Nokia, or as the Finns say, Nokia. Uh, and now that's our parent company. We used to obviously be AT&T, Lucent, then Alcatel, Lucent. So the blue is the Nokia blue. This is my corporate color. But here's what I want to show. This is, you should all be aware of, it's Innovator's Dilemma stuff from Clayton Christensen. He's clarified the model over time, and he basically says there's three types of innovation. There's the evolutionary, and his his uh, view is that that's what big companies do, or startups have become big, they evolve their products. Even better, someone's getting very excited. The two on the right hand side to you are the two types of disruptive innovation. One he calls revolutionary, and the other one he calls disruptive. I tend to call them both disruptive, but for the sake of argument today, let's call them revolution and disruption. Revolution can be done, he says, in big companies. It's where you restart a whole product space, redefine a product space, but you don't start from the absolute lowest cost. So you see that arrow starts from something called medium cost, and then you innovate and disrupt a market. 
His point is that a lot of truly, truly disruptive innovation starts going after the lowest cost market and then builds up to innovate to disrupt the, the, the most expensive, the premium market. And I, I think that's sort of fundamentally true. I would say Bell Labs is definitely a premium revolutionary uh, disruptor or revolutionary inno innovator. And startups generally try to go after that lower tier of, of lower cost structure because they're smaller entities. They tend to be more, slightly more efficient at, to, at getting to a low cost point and then innovating to the same endpoint. But that's key. The endpoint is the same for both. It's where you start that differs. And because you start in different places, you spend different amounts of time in that starting phase relative to the end phase. And yes, there is another point he makes out that it's very rare for a large company to enter a new market. If, if so, they normally acquire their way into that. And that's something that's well known to all of you because in the end, most startups end up being acquired by large companies. Very few survive intact. But I would argue Bell Labs has shown the ability, even in large companies, uh, to innovate and create a new market. They created the digital market. They were in switching, they created the digital market that was computing and, and all associated computing and networking systems. But otherwise, the two are not that different, and that's going to be an overriding theme of my presentation. Now, I want to add, so that was Clayton Christensen was the last one. This is a guy called John Cotter, also at Harvard, but he breaks this apart into how you do it. Christensen tells you roughly what you have to do, start here, go there. Cotter says how you do it. And I rather like this. In fact, I truly believe in this model. He says there's two operating systems you require. And you either start with both, or you start with one and, and build the other. And so you'll see this as we go. So operating system one, he thinks of as the brain. It, it has the habits of being completely not hierarchical. It is the best idea wins. Everyone mucks in, does everything. There's no structure in the company. And it's very fluid and creative, and it values the best idea of a process. That's what startups do. It's actually what Bell Labs does. The other part, and you see I've shown it as sort of a cog. The brain is on the, the left as you look at it, and the, the cog on the right. The cog is the engine that then creates a scalable product. And I think we all agree that companies need both. They need the initial invention. And he calls it operating system one because he says the behavior in that is very, very different from the behavior in the execution engine, which is all about scale, low cost, optimal performance, reliable, and, and essentially support for customers. So these two models are symbiotic. We almost show them as yin and yang here. And again, common to startups, com common to industrial innovation in a, in a place like Bell Labs. So we've got the, the what we do from, from Christensen. We've got the how from Cotter. So I'm actually going to show you now the time scale. I'm making this argument that there's different time scales in startups versus Bell Labs. So here we go. Can't see the bottom bar. The bottom bar, you know, if you look on the side screens, you can, says the startup phase is about a year of coming up with the initial prototype, initial idea in that green bar using angel seed funding or even personal funding, friends and family funding. And then after that, generally becomes VC backed. And the plot shows the time to exit by VCs from startups they, that they invest in. And you see around 2001, it was about three years. That middle point, it says 3.3 years. But over the last few years, it's become 6.8 years. The last bar it says 6.8 years. So if I add those two things up, I've got about seven years for the VC-backed phase, and I've got about one to two for the original innovation phase. Again, that's the, the operating system one and the operating system two, or the invention and the implementation phase. So let me show you sort of the Nokia Bell Labs part. These are three innovations that we came up with. They happen to be the first one is uh, all around uh, the reinvention of DSL, vectoring, the thing that actually allows you to communicate over copper in your home. We did some sort of amazing innovation and in interference cancellation there. And you see that the green bar, we spent about seven years on the research phase and about two on the commercialization. In the middle, uh, a set of optical innovations, about six years, I think we have five years on the research phase, three on commercialization, and then some wireless innovations around MIMO and technologies you've heard of there. Uh, where essentially we spent, about, again, about seven years on the research phase and two on commercialization. And why is that? It's because we've already got the big company there ready to receive the innovation. So we can spend more time exploring up front and then hand it off and grow it in a big entity already. Startup model, similar model, but you spend less time up front because you've got to grow the big entity or be acquired by the big entity. And so otherwise, very similar timescales. You see a total of about nine years from initial idea 
to endpoint. So here's my, uh, my one animation. These are my animations. Fantastic. I chose cogs. Think of them as propelling flywheels. So we're in, in uh, the context of propeller here. So left-hand example is the startup model. Startup model, little less time in the singular invention. I make this point about singular invention. When you have to be fast and spend less time in that upfront, you, you, you obviously have to, have to just focus on one thing. That's why I call it singular invention. Then the idea is to scale that, and after that scaling, generalize it into a platform. And many VCs, many ventures I've worked with, that's the model. You solve one business model problem with tech innovation, then you earn the right to grow it into a platform. The Bell Labs model is the right-hand side. You see that we do generalized invention. What it means is we look at the problem from many, many different uh, points of view, different aspects, where it could go, how you could reinvent things. We even challenge the laws of physics. That's why we end up winning these Nobel Prizes, is actually by accident. We do it because we try and really go as far as we possibly can with the initial invention. So we spend a lot of time in that first phase. But then we hand it off to this bigger flywheel that is the company where it spends less time in that, and that's how essentially we bring products to market. You see, there's not really much difference. I intentionally illustrate it the same way. The difference is mainly time. It's not the model. The model is very, very similar between the two. And the difference is we end up producing a platform to start with and then build that out. In the startup world, it tends to be build a product to start with and then generalize it into a platform. And that's the difference that's a result of those two timescales. So we really are cousins. We are brothers from another innovation mother. And so what I focus on is then the people behaviors. There's a people part to all of this, of course. The people behaviors that go along with this are a bit different. But they're also pretty similar. So if I look on the left here, we are all ambitious people, motivated innovators that want to change the world. Absolutely true, and everyone in Bell Labs, I'm sure, is absolutely true for all of you here. We are thinkers and doers. That means they are inventors and implementers. Companies need both. Companies actually probably need more doers than, than, uh, than thinkers, and that you have to get the right balance. And then perseverance is, of course, critical, and adaptation to changing market reality or changing vision uh, of the future. That's what we have in common. The thing we have different, again, that drives this difference in behavior, is that the big company innovation tends to be technology driven, not business model driven. Startups tend to try and innovate around a business model and find the technology that solves the business model problem. Big company seems to be more related to, I've got a technology, I've got a market, I'll build on that, and then I'll change the business model somehow. So that's a bit of a difference. Yeah, you don't make as much money in Bell Labs as you can if you're a part of a unicorn startup with founding stock or founding shares. So there's a bit of a difference. If your financial aspirations are huge, don't join Bell Labs. If they're medium, it's not a bad place to work. And so, but otherwise, I would say that the attribute of Bell Labsians, they tend to want to go for renown for having invented the future rather than financial gain. And then in the end, I've made this point is startups tend to be singularly focused on execution, whereas in the Bell Labs model, we're more focused on generalized solution discovery, inventing the future, and pushing the boundaries of mathematics, physics, et cetera, not just for the sake of it, but so that we create a new reality. And that just takes a little more time, which is what we have up front. So that's all I want to say today. I hope you see how we really are a continuum. We want to engage with you because we absolutely love the focus on business model transformation, and we've got a lot of cool technologies that we can share. And similarly, I think you should engage with us. A lot of smart people, they're in these blue shirts. The ones back there are not the best. Find the other ones. Uh, but when you find them, and we've got a booth over there, you see our little blue banner, it's very easy. Look for this color, and it's probably one of us. Come and chat. We're running uh, part of the startup competition. Uh, what we're looking for, best and brightest ideas. That's sort of our mantra. Best and brightest people with the best and brightest ideas is what we're looking for, and that's what we'll be voting for today. And then overall, those of you participating, we sum up between the different booths participating to, to pick the overall winner. Last thing I'll say, tonight, you're gonna to be sick of us by the end of uh, the day, we're doing a performance. In fact, this screen here behind me, uh, we brought today uh, with the World Stage team because we're doing an amazing performance with an artist uh, called BT Wolf, Aaron, the great connector of all people here, uh, put us in touch with BT. BT likes to consider herself
both a folk, a folk rock uh, artist and a supremely good one, but also a digital explorer. I encourage you to just look her up when you get a free moment when you're in the adult beverage tent, btwolf.com. She uh, has a jacket that essentially is an RFID jacket, but also the, the weave in it is the thread of a digital music track that she had made by Mr. Fish, who made jackets for uh, Hendrix and the Beatles, etc. famous tailor in London. So the, the weave is a, is, is a digital imprint of the signature, but embedded is RFID circuitry, so that when you actually go up to her, it starts playing the song on your phone. So that's sort of cool. She released an album on NFC cards. It was only available on a stack of NFC cards. You get like a pack of cards, and you scan your phone over it. And then she has a 360 degree virtual sort of immersive uh, set of music videos that you can look around and explore. What we're gonna do today with her is digitally enhance the performance using Bell Labs technologies. So you'll see a whole bunch of effects and I'll explain them more later tonight so you don't have to remember this. But it is one of the things we're beginning to do is understand that art and technology, or we'd say humanity and engineering, are getting closer together. So we're bringing this to, uh, to you for the first time and you as an audience will actually get to create the experience too, because the other part is you influence what goes on. So humanity and technology, or humanity and engineering and science coming together, and this expression of uh, art and technology is one way that Bell Labs is, is, is sort of demonstrating that for the good of mankind. It's something we started about 50 years ago. There's something called Experiments in Art and Technology with Andy Warhol and Rauschenberg and other artists in New York. We've recreated it over the last few weeks, and BT is the latest instantiation of it. So I hope you stay and enjoy that. Around about 7.15 tonight, you'll see some quite interesting uh, performances and amazing effects in BT's beautiful voice. So that's it from me. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting. If you want to debate any of it with me, we could do it here, but probably better to do it in the tent or over an adult beverage. Thanks very much, and goodbye for now, Hoboken.